Good afternoon. My name is Lynn, and I'm going to be talking to you today about plants gone wild. So we're going to focus on just plants, and we're going to talk a little bit about each plant that we have gotten reports as being invasive. And at the end, we'll talk about some of the plants that uh, the state of Kansas is deemed noxious, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means uh, as we get closer to it. So I'm going to turn my video off so that we have better internet capabilities. So the first thing we need to know is what is an invasive species? And it's not just plants. It can be animals and aquatic organisms. It can be diseases like Dutch elm disease. It can be insects, the most recent being the emerald ash borer that's devastating our ash trees in Kansas and then throughout the U.S. So it doesn't just have to be plants. Today's focus will be plants. So what is invasive? There's all kinds of definitions out there, but the one that seemed to be the most in sync was any plant or species that causes economic, environmental, or human health concerns. They displace our native plant species, and therefore that alters animal habitat, food sources are lost. Sometimes these plants will fuel or fires like cheatgrass, which is common out in western Kansas, or eastern red cedars that are throughout our plain states. Also, they can affect the quality of our wetlands and result in flooding. Mainly, if you think about waterways, anything that would plug up waterways, sometimes people will consider cattails or lilies, or sometimes some of our perennials will escape into wet areas. The other thing, and really important for any state that's a big crop producer, is these plants interfere with crop production, meaning that the farmers are docked for having weeds in their crops that they're harvesting. Also, for homeowners, a lot of times invasive species will decrease property values. Here's a picture of our eastern red cedar. It is our true native evergreen in Kansas. But if not managed properly, it will take over a range in pasture land and therefore will have an economic impact on farmers that are trying to raise cattle. So we want to have our native species, but we need to manage it to keep it in its boundaries. So with that said, invasive plants do not stay within their boundaries. They'll be planted one place and then escape or move to other areas. And how does that happen? Well, these are very aggressive plants with invasive characteristics. They reproduce rapidly. They have abundant seed production. That seed remains viable for a long time. It can stay dormant until conditions are favorable and then start to grow. They also will have a high seed germination rate. So when animals or birds eat the seed and poop it out, you have a high germination rate. A lot of those plants will, will germinate and then become a problem. They also have rapid growth and will spread either by rhizomes as well as the root system. So it's not just the seeds, it can be the root system as well. They usually establish over large areas and then they persist. And the main thing is they displace our existing native plants. Uh, they're just so aggressive that they take over. Here's an example of a plant in my own garden. So I have a perennial garden at the back of my property, and somebody gave me a gooseneck loosestrop, one plant. And three years later, you can see what happened. So this is the weed I'm talking about. Actually, this is a desirable perennial. And so what you need to know about plants is when you first plant them, they sleep. They're getting their roots established. The second year they creep, meaning the root system is really starting to get fueled up with carbohydrates from photosynthesis that the plant carries on. And then the third year it leaps. It becomes above ground and you can see how it's overtaken this perennial bed. It's now thick in the irises. This is a quince bush that it's also underneath. And so at this point, it's almost impossible to control 
with any kind of chemical. You can manually dig it out, but you'd have to dig out your desirable plants, remove all the tiny white roots that are growing in amongst these rhizomes, and then replant the irises. And so it can be quite the challenge to take some of these plants out of existing plants that you want to keep. Let's talk about some other characteristics. This happens to be bamboo. These are the shoots coming up in early spring. And this is what it looks like a few years down the road. A lot of these plants have very aggressive roots or rhizomes. They have large food reserves. So as the plant makes photosynthesis for food, it stores that food in the root system. And they have a high photosynthetic rate. Matter of fact, they can make a lot more food than your typical native plant. And this gives them a competitive advantage. There are over 1,100 plant species that have been reported as being invasive. And that varies from area to area, soil type to soil type, climate to climate. So it just depends on where you live, which plants are considered invasive. Some invasive species were actually planted intentionally, mainly for erosion control. So crown vetch that you're seeing on the right in this picture, that was brought in by the highway departments to plant along the roadsides to hold the soils in place after they built the roads. Some plants were brought in for livestock grazing. They had a high photosynthetic rate, lots of carbohydrates in them, and therefore they were very conducive for livestock to graze on, but then they took over. Wildlife habitats. Sometimes we bring in plants to create habitat for pheasants or quail. And then again, ornamental purposes. We try to improve our cultivars year after year for better flowering, for color, for smell, for different characteristics. And sometimes those plants become invasive. So it depends again, like I said, on what region of the country you are, soil types, weather, all of that, weather plants become aggressive. So how do these plants get moved? We've already talked about that a little bit, and that is by our wildlife eating the seeds or berries and then pooping them out, and they have a high germination rate. Well, we can also move them through nursery stock. This is a picture of a forsythia that's been bald and burlapped. And you can see growing out right here, this is Canada thistle. So the unbeknownst homeowner will come in to buy this plant and plant it in their landscape. And then Canada thistle will grow through the root system as well as will flower and produce seed. They can also buy plants that are contaminants in aquatics. So a lot of people have um, farm ponds and they will pull water out of the pond maybe to irrigate and therefore they can move some plants that way. One of the most common ways in the western part of Kansas is through cultivating equipment, harvest equipment. So if this field of wheat were full of thistles and the combine came through to harvest, they would also harvest the thistle seed and then that would be moved on this equipment as it went from field to field. So it happens rather easily. The other way it can travel is international commerce. So that's how emerald ash borer became prolific in the United States. It came in on pallets. The, the borers were actually in the pallets that held um, merchandise. And then when the pallets were offloaded from the boat. The boars went through their change and came out as beetles and flew to local ash trees. And then the spread began. And they can trace it back to an area in Michigan where that happened. But don't be fooled to think it's only people or equipment. Air, water, animals, all this natural movement of weeds also occurs. And so we just need to be able to be aware of the species and then management strategies to try to overcome their invasiveness. So we're gonna start 
by a disclaimer. This presentation is about building awareness for different plants that can be invasive. We'll speak a little bit about control strategies, but it's so complex that when we talk about chemical, which should be your last option in the control strategy, it gets very, very complex. There's lots of details, meaning that products are specific to use sites, to different plants that they control, and homeowners have access to different products than people that are licensed users. So if you see restricted use on products, that means you have to have a license to use them or work under somebody with a license. And so farmers who are usually licensed have a whole different array of chemicals that they can use to control plants that are very different than homeowners. There's also different labeling for products that can be used in non-crop situations like your home versus cropland or pasture rangeland. And so you need to be aware of that and know that there are different restrictions in regards to grazing for these products. So it gets very complex. So we're just gonna uh, touch on a little bit of the control strategies. I'm gonna give you links for each of the weeds that you can go into and download at a later time to get more specifics. So the first one I wanna talk about is Multiflora Rose. This is the rose that was planted years ago as a living fence to keep livestock within its boundaries. Unfortunately, this shrub is a lot more aggressive than our hybrid tea roses or shrub roses that we have today. And what we found is they infested our pastures. And so this is considered a woody invasive species. So there's two publications I wanna draw your attention to. The first one is from our buddies over in Missouri, and they have an excellent publication on how to control invasive multiflora rose. Pottawatomie County in Kansas, they've put together a brush control in pasture rangeland. And so it will talk about how to control woody plants, which are considered brush, and they will list products, probably some of those you will have to have a license to use and some of those you won't, but they will also have some guidance around grazing and that kind of thing. The next one, and we've talked a little bit about this already, is their native evergreen, the Eastern Red Cedar. It was planted and is being planted for use in windbreaks. There is male plants and female plants. The female plants are the ones that grow the berries. That's what our wildlife eats and then passes it through their digestive system. And then we get the spread of Eastern red cedar. It's very easy to manage this invasive. And that is a single cut to the ground and this will not re-sprout if you cut it close enough to the ground. Fire is also a way that they control it, and so in the cons of prairie, that is one of the strategies that they use. Now, this plant really does go up fast when it's burned. So in a homeowner situation, burning would not be a strategy I would use because they burn very hot and it's easy to spread. Here are a couple of publications. The first one is from the Kansas Forest Service. And the second one is for uh, University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And they've got two great uh, publications on management strategies for Eastern Red Cedar. The next plant is found in our home landscapes. And this is the burning bush. And the way you can identify it is if you look at the stems or twigs, there is kind of this quirkiness to the stems. It has beautiful red fall color right now. And so it's easy to identify. It is very adaptable. And where they're having the most problem with it is in the Eastern part of the United States. And it's invading the forest land out there. I have 
heard of a few people that have seedlings growing near and around their euonymus, but they have not found that it's really gotten out of control. But there is an excellent publication that Purdue has put together on managing burning bush. Heavenly bamboo, I bring this one up because of my birding friends. Um, I've got several friends that bird watch and feed birds. And I did a little research and this plant has cyanide in it. All parts of the plant are toxic. And so if birds eat a lot of the berries and it has to be quite a bit of the berries, they will actually be poisoned. Um, so it not only is invasive, but it does have toxic properties and it spreads vigorously from its root system. So again, Texas has put together a great publication on controlling this plant. So buyer beware. Purple loose strife, I have to admit, I have this one in my garden. I have had it in my garden for almost 20 years now. My garden has very high content of clay. I only water in extreme conditions. And so like this summer has been very dry and it was watered once. My 20 year old plant is still in its boundaries. It has not spread, but where you do see it spreading is in wet areas. So the picture below is a pond and you can see how it has spread. So if this were a waterway, that was used to um, fill the pond or a creek that would go into a town or a water supply source. This would and could plug those ditches and impede the flow of water and therefore then you would have flooding. So a mature plant can have 30 to 50 stems arising from a single root. As I said, I do not have that issue in my garden, but I know it's a big problem up in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Utah, Idaho. They have a severe problem with it in that area. This is a problem in Wyandotte County, and that is Tetarian honeysuckle. Some people call this bush honeysuckle. It's easy to identify. Right now, it is the only green shrub understory shrub in our wooded lands. It has these beautiful, almost fluorescent red berries. Of course, that's a great source of food for our birds. And again, as it goes through their digestive system, almost all of these seeds germinate. It is deciduous, it has opposite leaves, and it's the first one to green up in the spring and the last one to lose its leaves in the fall. It um, is fairly easy to control. You can burn it if, if you're in an area where you can burn. You can cut the stems and then immediately treat with different chemicals. Uh, one chemical that everyone has access to is glyphosate. That's the active ingredient and it's a 20% solution. Fall is a great time to control a lot of these woody plants. They're taking all those carbohydrates they've made all summer through the leaves and moving in into the root system for the winter. They will also be taking in the chemical that you treat. Some areas it may be too late to be treating, but this particular plant still has green leaves and still can be treated. Now the secret to cut stump treatments, that's what they call these treatments, is you cannot cut the stem, go in the garage, mix up your chemical, come back out and treat. You need to cut the stem and treat, cut the stem and treat, cut the stem and treat. If you allow that cut area to seal over, it will not take the chemical in to the root system uh, very efficiently. That's true of all woody species. The other thing you need to note is the translocation area of a stem is just beneath the bark. So if we had a one foot diameter tree that we have cut, there's no need in treating the entire surface of the cut area. You would treat just beneath the bark about an inch in, that's the conducting tissue, that's where the chemical would be sucked into the root system. 
Japanese honeysuckle can be just as aggressive. Um, this one is kind of hard for people because hummingbirds love it as a nectar source. But if you keep it managed, you can have both worlds. Um, burning, again, if allowable, or glyphosate treatments can be very effective. Again, it's considered a woody vine, so you might want to cut it and then treat immediately. And here's a great publication on honeysuckle in general through the K-State Research and Extension site. So you can download this and learn everything you need to know about honeysuckle. I think the Kansas Forest Service also has a publication of control measures for bush honeysuckle. English ivy, a lot of people don't think of this as an invasive species, although it is very aggressive. You can see in the bottom picture how it's growing up the trees. Sometimes this can get so heavy on the limbs it will actually break limbs. Also, this foliage may cover tree foliage. And again, the reason plants have foliage is to make food for itself. So if it suffocates the tree's foliage, it impairs photosynthesis, okay? Again, you would come in here, cut the vine at the base of the tree, and then immediately treat it with chemical. You can sometimes cut this and keep it managed from growing up the tree by just cutting it. Uh, it won't control the entire plant, but it will keep it from crawling up the tree. But you got to stay on it. You just can't do it once and walk away. Trumpet vine or creeper is also a very aggressive vine, gets very heavy. It will collapse structures. Here we've got a wooden structure that is growing up, again, for the birding people, a great nectar source for hummingbirds. But this one, if not kept in check, will also become aggressive and move out of its boundaries. Um, it spreads by seeds mainly although the root system can be very tough as well. Mint, anybody that's grown mint, this is a case, a garden, almost a little raised bed here. One plant was planted in this corner and in two years, it took over the entire garden. And so what I recommend is simply putting it in pots, but the key to remember, if the pot has holes in the bottom, which we all know we should be planting, in containers with holes, do not set it on the ground because the roots will go out those holes and get established in the soil and then will move underground. So put it on a deck or on concrete or something to keep the roots from coming out those holes. Star of Bethlehem, I know firsthand how prolific this little guy can get. Very beautiful white flowers, uh, grass-like foliage, in the spring, but it gets to be very aggressive. It is a perennial. It grows from bulbs, and you can see here where the plant's been dug up, and bulblets form on these bulbs, and that's mainly how it spreads. The tricky part about this one is this plant blooms until the end of May, and then it melts down to where there is no foliage. So it doesn't look like there's a problem after it blooms and melts down. But what you don't know is underground, all of these bolus are starting to form and spread. So you can dig all you want, but if you leave any of those little bulblets in the ground, they're going to come back with a vengeance. Products containing carfentrazone, again, this is the active ingredient in products, or sofentrazone. So weed um, free zone. Speed zone, these are different chemicals with that active ingredient in it, can be effective. There is an excellent publication, just a page or two on Star of Bethlehem that K State Research and Extension has put together. But all these little white flowers, this is how aggressive this can be. And you can see when the other perennials that you're trying to encourage are trying to come up, you almost would have to dig all of these desirables out and then treat the entire area. And you only have until probably the end of May before all this foliage dies down and you don't even know it's there. Obedient plant. 
anybody that grows this plant knows that whoever named it had to be a little off the rocker. But the reason it is called obedient plant is because of our floral people. So these individual flowers can actually be manipulated so that all the flowers are moved onto one side of the plant. So the florists love it because they can manipulate this flower head so it shows off the best in arrangements. For, for anybody growing it in their yard, it is anything but obedient. It is like that gooseneck loose stripe that I showed you early on about the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, and the third year it leaps. That's what this one does. And it can be very, very aggressive in moist soils. Again, I have seen this in more of a dry perennial bed and it does not spread, but it will be very aggressive in moist soils. Crown vetch, we kind of talked about this early on in the presentation. This is the plant that the highway departments intentionally planted for erosion control. It is a legume. It spreads by rhizomes and seeds, and it lays viable in the soil for years. Frequent mowing and close mowing can control vetch, but you have to, again, be diligent and stay on top of it. Northern sea oats. This is an ornamental grass that's very attractive in the landscape. It has these really pretty brown seed heads in the fall, but every one of these seeds will germinate. And so a small area can just become overtaken with this particular ornamental grass. An easy way to contain it is once these seed heads turn brown, remove them. Another grass, ornamental grass that is beautiful, is this variegated ribbon grass. But believe me, it spreads vigorously through the root system. It's tolerant of most soils. And so again, this is a case where you would probably want to use a high rate of glyphosate. And again, please follow the label directions before using any product for the appropriate location of its use, the species it'll control, and the use rates. Teasel. This one is on the uh, county noxious weed list for certain counties in Kansas. There are two types of teasel. There's the cut leaf teasel and the common teasel. The cut leaf teasel obviously has foliage with cuts in it or dissected foliage. And so they both look about the same in the bloom pattern although one of them has more of a pink bloom, the other has kind of a, a white flower. So the common teasel would have more of the pinkish lavender flowers and the cut leaf would be white. How this one gets spread is people love to go out and cut this for dried arrangements in the fall. And inside of the seed head is tiny, tiny, tiny black seeds. And so when it dries and people put these in floral arrangements, they will drop seed, getting them from their car into their home. And so it can be a real problem. This one's fairly easy to control. It's a biennial, meaning the first year it forms a rosette in the ground. The second year, it sends up a seed head, flowers, goes to seed, and then the plant is done. So you could go out and either dig up the rosettes in the first year, or the second year, you could come back and cut off all the seed heads, and then the plant would be done. If there's a lot in the area, you can use products that contain triclopyr, 2,4-D, or glyphosate, so they can be managed. Here are two publications that the Kansas Department of Agriculture has put together. The first one is for common teasel. The second is for cutleaf teasel and basically pretty similar in control measures. The next tree we're gonna talk about is calorie pear, ornamental pears. This is the most planted tree for spring flowers. And years ago, it was brought to the United States to improve disease resistance of our common pear that we use to harvest for food. Since then, they have found that these trees have really poor branching structure. 
And so when they're about 15 to 20 years old, the branching structure is so poor that it breaks apart with wind storms, high storms. And so the botanists got together and decided to create some new cultivars that are better branching. And with that, these different cultivars cross pollinate and produce fruits and then viable seed. Our animals, squirrels, raccoons, they eat these. And again, it goes through their digestive system and a vacant lot then becomes full of these escape pairs. And you can really notice this in the spring of the year when the white flowers are out. You can also notice these in the fall because pears have a beautiful maroon fall foliage. Some of these escapes will be very, very thorny. So again, this is where you would make one single cut to the base of the tree and treat it with one of those cut stump herbicides. Here's a excellent publication that the Kansas Forest Service has put together on cow repair. So again, it's easy to manage before you let it do this. Once you have this many plants, it's going to take you a lot of time to go out and individually cut those stems to the ground and then treat those. And remember, you cut, you treat, you cut, you treat. You don't cut them all, then come back and treat them. It has to be instantaneous. Now we're gonna shift gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about noxious weeds. These are weeds that the Kansas legislature has determined that they are noxious. And they have in practice statutes that say that landowners have got to control these weeds. There is economic incentives to control them. If you don't control them, an active weed department can come out, treat them on your property, and then charge you for that. So it's mainly done in the counties of Kansas and other states where it's active crop production. Because like I said, this is must thistle over here, full of seeds once this flower is done. And that then gets into the fields and the farmers are docked for having seeds in their crops. Contact information, the Kansas Department of Agriculture has a wonderful web page and here's the link to that. They have information on control strategies for each of the 12 noxious weeds in Kansas. They also have information on teasel as well. So let's talk about some of these plants. The list includes all of these 12. I am not going to take time to talk about each of these. I'm just going to pull out the best ones that I get the most calls on. Um, so let's walk through these. And these are all on that website that I just showed you. First one, Phil Bindweed. Early, we did a poll of what you feel is the most invasive plant in your area and filled bindweed one hands down. Second was calorie pear or ornamental pear. So filled bindweed is a problem throughout Kansas. I want to point out that years ago, the state Kansas Department of Ag put together these maps. And this is all the counties in Kansas. The darker the square, the more of the plant has been reported. And so there are some counties like Wyandotte County where I come out of, where there is no reporting. So anything with slashes through the county means nothing's been reported. That doesn't mean there are not plants, it just means it hasn't been reported. And then there's other counties where there hasn't been a lot of acreage reported. But when you get down into these purple, that means there's a lot of plants that they have have uh, documented. This one is a tough one to control, particularly in landscapes, homeowner landscapes, because oftentimes it grows up in our shrubs and our plants, and then chemical control is almost impossible. You can try pulling this, but these roots and rhizomes can go down three to four feet into the ground, if not deeper. 
And so it takes due diligence to keep this controlled. Culturally, hand pulling, you're gonna have to do it several times during the year. Chemicals, you'll probably have to control it with chemicals several times during the year and for several years. There are many products labeled to control it. Glyphosate, which we've talked about a lot, is one, Trimac, Triclopyr, and Quinclorac. Again, these are active ingredients found in numerous products. So this is when it gets tough. This is barberry, which is a desirable shrub, and this is bindweed that's come up from the base of the plant and growing prolifically. It will eventually smother out this barberry and kill it. So again, very difficult situation. Probably what I would recommend doing is trying to pull as much of this to the side, laying cardboard under it beneath the desirable shrub and the foliage of the bindweed, and then using one of those crafts uh, paint brushes that looks like a sponge and wearing rubber gloves, mixing it up as the label says, and then painting that glyphosate on the bindweed, trying to avoid at all costs getting that on the desirable shrub. And again, that's gonna take patience and time and probably several applications for it to come under control. The Kansas Department of Ag has an excellent publication on controlling bindweed. Must thistle, you've seen this picture before. This is the thistle that is a biennial. First year it produces this rosette and this rosette has kind of a gray to white border on the foliage, easy to identify. Second year, it sends up this flower stalk and you have these large magenta purplish blooms. These are full of seeds. So again, an easy way to control it is to dig out the rosettes the first year or to simply keep the seeds from forming, removing the flower stalks the second year. They've also brought in different weevils that will get into the flower heads and eat the seeds. Now you may or may not know, but when they do that, that's called biological control and rarely will a species, a weevil in this case, eradicate the problem, but it will help to reduce it. 2,4-D or Banville are also very effective if, if you've got a field of it and you can't go out and manually control it. Precaution, when using 2,4-D or Banville, you've got to read the label because these products in high temperatures will actually volatilize and move off of the plant you've sprayed in the wind and will damage other nearby desirable plants. So again, follow the label when you're using these products. There are two excellent publications. One of them is the Department of Agriculture, and the second one is by K-State Research and Extension. So great information out there if you have a problem with must thistle. Another thistle that's quite troublesome in Kansas is Canada thistle. This one is actually a perennial, so much, much, much harder to control than musk thistle. It reproduces from rhizomes underground and seeds, and it both has male plants and female plants. And again, the female plants are the ones that flower and produce seed. They're both a problem though, because they both can spread by the root system. They have really small flowers about the size of a dime in comparison to bull thistle and to musk thistle, which would even be bigger than the bull thistle. So easy to control with 2,4-D and products containing clopyrrolid, which is the active ingredient in numerous products. Here's a publication again by the Kansas Department of Ag that will talk about control strategies for Canada thistle a little different than the musk thistle. Ceresia lespedesia. This is one that was brought in intentionally. It was brought in to uh, help revegetate the mine lands in Southeast Kansas. And also was also a mix in CRP acreage. 
but they did not realize how aggressive this plant can be. It has trifoliate foliage, so it kind of looks like baseball bats, three of them in kind of a leaf arrangement. So they're easy to identify. It gets fairly tall, about three to four foot tall. It has white flowers. And let me tell you, the pollinators love this plant. So when it's in flower, you'll see bees and beetles and all kinds of things foraging for the nectar. Strategies are usually to have a mixture of burning, grazing, and chemicals. There are a few chemicals that are very effective, but again, the timing is critical of when you use these products. There is, again, an excellent publication by both K-State Research and Extension and the Department of Agriculture, um, but it's very difficult to control and the strategy is very complex. So this is one where you definitely need to download these publications, read it thoroughly and follow it to a T. Johnson grass, probably in Wyandotte County, this is our number one uh, invasive weed, mainly in our road ditches. The second would be teasel. So our road ditches in Wyandotte County are just overtaken with these invasive species. We have reduced mowing because of costs in counties. And so that's why a lot of these weeds are aggressive because we're no longer mowing off the seed heads like we used to. Johnson grass is a perennial grass. It's really tall, gets six to eight foot tall, and it reproduce, reproduces from seeds and rhizomes. Here's a look at the rhizomes. So we just dug these plants up and this thick rhizome is full of carbohydrates. So very difficult to control with chemicals because you've got all these carbohydrates in that system. And so it takes multiple applications. A 2% glyphosate treatment in the fall works really well. Um, it's, out, it's throughout Kansas. So not one area is worse than others but it's hard to take a grass out of a grass. So people who grow corn in Kansas, this is their number one nemesis. You cannot easily take this one out of corn unless you have Roundup Ready corn. Here's an excellent publication put together by the Kansas Department of Agriculture on controlling Johnson grass. My master gardeners have a demonstration garden uh, that is a vegetable demonstration garden. And the area we selected was full of Johnson grass. We read the publication and we applied glyphosate at the recommended rate in mid-September. We had timed it after a rainfall. That's when Johnson grass was very receptive to taking in the chemical. It took it into the root system and we got a very, very thorough kill doing a fall application. We have had to go back from time to time and spot treat in the garden or dig it out um, to keep it managed. One thing I want to say, and I can't say this with any more importance, but you've got to read and follow label directions. Is the weed that you're trying to control on the label? Is the site to be sprayed on the label? In other words, is it labeled for pasture and rangeland? Is it labeled for roadsides? Is it labeled for non-cropland? And then most importantly, what is the rate? When do I put it out? What timing? And then does the product have any kind of restrictions like grazing or something you need to take into account? Remember we talked about the 2,4-D banvil being a treatment for the thistles. There are temperature restrictions on those to keep the product from volatilizing or moving off target. So you need to read and follow all label directions before using any chemical. And chemicals should be your last strategy. You should try to remove flowers and seeds, dig it out, or whatever you can do to keep it managed before it gets to the point where you have to use chemicals. So with that said, I just want to pull back up the Kansas Department of Agriculture website 
um, because it will have excellent information on all the noxious weeds that we talked about. So I thank you for your participation today and we'll open it up to questions. Thank you.